Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Lovely. Um, I'm only using the mic because we're recording today so other people can see it afterwards. Um, welcome to this wonderful celebration of, for the winner of the uh, Chalmers Medal 2021. Professor Charles Wonji. It's been long, long in the setting up, but I'm so pleased that you can all be here with us. Um, so we're here to celebrate Charles and his work, which is wonderful, and um, we'll have some time after his talk to us today to have some questions and answers. Uh, but a bit about RSTMH, um, first of all. So I'm Tamar Gosh, I'm Chief Exec of RSTMH, and I'm delighted um, to be here, and this is one of our amazing medals and awards that we give out every year to recognize success in our sector and in fact the 2022 applications um, are live at the moment so if you have someone that you really want to recognize who's done amazing work either at the start of their career middle or very senior please do go on our website and have a look at the medals and awards that you could nominate for there's some great ones so RSTMH is a membership society a charity a network for those who are working in or interested in tropical medicine and global health we publish scientific journals. We run meetings and events, normally um, around the world, starting to, to get so a bit like that, less, less virtual. We give out um, our medals and awards that like we have today. And also we give out grants, early career grants for those that are starting off their research careers and want to do a one-year project to the value of up to 5,000 pounds. So if you're in that category, or if you know someone in that category, please do tell them about it. We're getting more and more funding to support more and more people, and they're open to any kind of research, lab all the way through to policy, any country, any type of area of tropical medicine or global health. Um, we gave out 200 awards last year, and we'll have more this year. It opens in February next, so you've missed this year, but 2023 could be the year for those you know to take part, so do tell them about it if you can. Okay, I'll say a bit more about RSTMH at the very end, uh, but, but just to tell you about what's going to happen today, so I'll introduce the person who nominated Charles for the medal, um, and then we'll have Charles's talk and some Q&A. After that, we've got some time um, hosted by our president, Professor Janet Hemingway, and a reception just around the corner uh, in one of the other rooms, which I always forget the name of. Is it Nike? New Kundi Room. Um, so please come there for a drink um, and some snacks to celebrate Janet's um, term of office as president. All right, so without further ado, I will introduce Professor Hilary Ranson, who is the very first Dean of Research, Culture and Integrity, um, and also Professor of Medical Entomology here at LSTM. Um, Hilary is a good friend of the Society, and I was so delighted um, that we were able to um, award this medal through you to Charles. So Hilary, over to you. So, um it's a real great pleasure to, to be here um, introducing the award to, to Charles. I met Charles back in 2004 when he joined LSTM as a, as a postdoc. Um, and he soon went on to establish his own independent funding, um, culminating in the Senior Research uh, Fellowship from Wellcome Trust, which we've had subsequently been, been renewed. And so he soon established himself as, a, as an independent um, scientist. And in doing so, I think Charles has really, I mean, one of the reasons that I think he's such a worthy recipient of this award is that he has always really strongly advocated and supported the careers of others. And he has mentored um, huge numbers of, of scientists throughout his career. Um, I think since obtaining his PhD, his own PhD over 18 years ago now, he's supported another 20 uh, PhD students, uh, 10 of which have since graduated and most of them, I think, are now still working in, in research careers and organizations uh, across the world. And I think he's also recognized um, the value that the, his fellowships provided him in securing his own independence and supported so many um, scientists to secure their own independent funding and, and set them on their way to um, independence. So I think as a, as a role model and as a mentor, I think Charles is, is, is really excelling and, and providing opportunities for others. But I think in recognizing the um, Charles's vision and a shared vision of, of, of many, many of us um, in, in the room is, is a reduction in the burden of vector-borne diseases. I think he's recognized that you don't need to just support individuals. You need to have strong research institutions led, uh, led in Africa. And I think one of the amazing things that Charles has done in the last few years, in fact, just two years after returning to his native Cameroon with his uh, Wellcome Fellowship, is to establish CRID, the Centre for Research and Infectious Diseases in Yaoundé. And since, I think, so it's about five years old now, I think, and 
in that time, this has really just thrived as a, um, a center of excellence for research in, in infectious diseases, particularly vector-borne diseases, but, um, malaria, dengue, osteoporosis, sleeping sickness, but also expanding into collaborations with other partners as well in, in, in um, other non-vector-borne diseases. And the partnerships that CRID has uh, formed and established with, um, with academic collaborations across the globe, also you know, funding from many different organizations um, and also stakeholders um, outside academia as well. And I think I know that you've been, and I hope we'll hear more about this, this evening, some of the, the work that you've been doing with training of future generations of vector control experts and, and just you know, really an, an institute that's just, just gone from going from strength to strength and, and is really, I think, already um, be becoming a leading player as a, a leading place in central, the leading place in Central Africa for, for infectious disease. So I've also played um, a really fundamental role in the establishment of um, a capacity strengthening project and the partnership for increasing the um, uh, impact of vector control. And that PVEC project has um, now, I think, trained over 30 different scientists um, across Africa from um, sort of mid-level um, uh, research fellows to more junior research um, their members of their team. And another thing that the PVEC project has done under Charles's leadership is to establish uh, technical vector control advisory groups that are working with different stakeholders in ministries, in NGOs, um, with, with um, the national control programs on various different vector-borne diseases um, in each of the countries in which PVEC operates. So in Cameroon, with the TV CAG that, that Charles has established um, has been really successful and is now embedded in the Ministry of Health and has so it's got a, a longer term future beyond the, the funding of this project. And I think it shows that the, the value of that partnership and Charles's ability to bring stakeholders together and you know, focus on a problem and, and really deliver results. So I think that's a really good um, example of, of sustainability. Um, Charles is also increasingly um, being recognized and invited to uh, join committees, participate in training programs. Um, he's off, I think, to tomorrow to, to, to talk, uh, to participate in the science of eradication, of malaria eradication course in Boston and then deliver um, some training at the um, Biology of Disease, uh, Biology of Palaces and CSP, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> the Woods Hole program. Uh, um, but he's also a member of um, RDCC's External Advisory Committee and is, has been selected as a, one of a small number of the um, assessor group for three qualifications of vector control products in World Health Organization. So his expertise is in huge demand um, across the world. And I think you can see why, because you spend any time with Charles and it, it's just uh, energizing and inspiring. I think he's, he's, he's infectious, um, enthusiasm for addressing the next uh, scientific problem um, and the way he does that, the way he works with teams to, to bring the team together and, and you know, support members of, of, the, uh, of his team in delivering these results and, and networks with, with, with all necessary partners to really accelerate that change is, is, is really inspiring. And I think that, that this, this commitment for supporting the careers of others, his leading role in establishing that career as a, as a uh, center for expertise um, in infectious disease in Central Africa um, and his own research outputs and his own leading research on um, developing new diagnostics for uh, tracking insecticide resistance and mitigating the impact of insecticide resistance on disease control programs make him a really worthy recipient of the, the Chalmers Medal and I'm really delighted that, uh, um, that you're here today to, to tell us more about your work. Thank you. Charles. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much, Hilary, for this very nice introduction. And uh, when I will through my presentation, you will see that actually there's a lot of thanks that I should give to, to you for what you have done uh, for my career. But allow me to start this talk by just presenting the title that I chose, A Journey. Uh, is it, what's it?
Yes, the title of my talk is a journey through building a capacity for sustainable global health from south to north and back to the south. And I will tell you more about that. Just to explain that my PhD uh, years were quite foundational in terms of what I have achieved and done uh, after that. I started uh, doing my PhD in Cameroon at the uh, OSEAC, uh, registered at the University of the One. And um, I was fortunate to be given an opportunity by a French scientist called uh, Dr. Didier Fontenin, who then was based in Cameroon. And he was looking for a PhD student who can work on the topic of uh, genetic structure of malaria, major malaria vectors at the Felix Gambier using microsatellite markers. And at that time, I was already working at OSEAC uh, after my master as a, a trainee doing microsatellite, but on Crypanosoma Bousse, the uh, 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 pathogen of uh, sleeping sickness. So I was well placed to do the work. He gave me the chance to, to prove myself, which I did, and then uh, the work went on. I learned a lot from that time because my supervisor really was open-minded and he wanted to build capacity. And for that, he, se he sent me to be trained internationally. I went to CDC Atlanta, working with one of the experts in the field of population genetics, analyzing my data. I went to France. I discovered the world uh, out of Africa, if you can say so. And that was important because having a bigger perspective of life was really useful for the future step later. And not only that, but also in terms of uh, scientific outputs. I was productive during that time, and my supervisors also really encouraged me to uh, publish uh, as much as I can, as you can see. And later on, that's what allowed me to be known outside Cameroon, outside Africa. Beside that, I was also given the choice, the, 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 the privilege to attend international scientific conferences. Uh, you can see here, uh, it's uh, in Atlanta attending the ISTMH meeting in, 20, in 2001, just after 9-11. It was not easy traveling then, but I did. And it was a time to interact and to learn how um, uh, to discuss with the broader scientific community. And besides that, I also applied very early to uh, uh, research grants. And my uh, supervisor taught me to apply uh, to a research training grant. It wasn't too much. It was 10,000 10, uh, US dollars. It might sound small, but it was important then because I learned how to write a grant and to uh, wait for the result, for the outcome, which is not easy. But when it was successful, it was great. And it was the start of a journey, really. Um, I will say that because later on, after my PhD, I got another one of 25K from uh, the same TGR. And I was at that stage ready for the next step. But what would be the next step? I had two choices. My supervisors and his collaborators had already planned a five years project in the US, working in the same topic as my PhD. And then I came across this advert from the Liverpool School looking for a postdoc to work on insecticide resistance using quantitative genetics. I was interested and I applied, hoping that I may be selected, although I really doubted I would get the job because at that time my English was not the best and I was really uh, con uh, conscious that I may not stand a chance. But I applied and I was shortlisted for interview I came, and that time I was actually welcomed by Hillary for a, pre, a, a dinner before the interview. And I remember I asked Hillary, uh, could you show me please, who is Hillary Hanson? And she said, it's me. And I was so surprised. Why? Because in my mind, she was much older. <laughs> because you can see that, that paper, that famous paper published in uh, 2000, was well known in the, in, the, in the area, in the, in the, in the topic, in the, in the field, sorry. And I was thinking that she was really more uh, older than she was looking. But it looks like it was not a problem because I got the position. So Hillary didn't <laughs> uh, use it against me, if you can say so. I was selected, and it was a big surprise. But it just shows you really that sometimes, as a scientist, you need to be ready to take the risk because someone may not potentially fill all the boxes, but 
we should be ready to give the chance to the, to the person. That's why I'm very grateful today to really, um, to, to Janet and Hilary, who are all here today, to the opportunity, for the opportunity given to me, uh, coming from Africa. And you know, it's not often that you see a PhD student, a PhD order, recently awarded PhD uh, order, coming straight to UK. We tend to have that in, in Europe or in the Western world, but I think we need to do that more because it can change the dynamic of things. So, I came here mainly because the topic of insecticide resistance was really relevant. There was, uh, for a major malaria vector, it's called Anopheles rhinestis, the discovery that it has developed resistance. And the question was, what is driving that resistance? And we wanted to identify the genes behind it. And the approach that was suggested to me was to use what we call genetic mapping, or QTL mapping, to detect those genes. Partly, I was to use the microsatellite DNA that I used for my PhD, so I was familiar with it. But the full uh, analytical pathway was new, so I was to learn about that, and I was actually supported to learn. And I went to, uh, to uh, uh, summer uh, lectures in, in the US to learn about uh, analyzing the data, and soon I became uh, um, efficient, if you can say so, in analyzing those data. And we detected the major QTL, so the area of the genome hosting most of these genes. And I was, I'm presenting this slide because uh, I made two major, two major moves that really helped my career. At that time, 20, 2006, I think, Hilary left to go to uh, Imperial College for a sabbatical, and I was pretty much working alone because Janet being the director of the school, couldn't do the day-to-day -day work that I was doing with Hilary. But I noticed that we, I was getting a lot of results, but there was a lot of work. And I decided to go to see Il, uh, Janet, uh, asking her whether I could uh, recruit a technician to help me, to support me. And thankfully, she said yes. And I re recruited Helen Irving, who is in the room, and she has been working with me since uh, 2006, 17 years, 16 years now. And uh, it, we have done tremendous work together. And even now, the work we are doing in Cameroon, she is supporting it, and it's an opportunity for me to thank her for that. The second move I made after we generated the first QTL mapping was to go to see Janet again, because I needed to better uh, uh, fine scale, of, um, uh, do a fine, map, fine scale mapping of the area, and we needed to sequence a large piece of the genome if we couldn't do it with the normal Sanger. So I needed to, 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 to sequence what we call the back clone, and it was expensive then, 9,000 to sequence, 9,000 pounds to sequence 120 KB. And I went to see Janet, could you allow me to do that? And apparently I was convincing in the way I, I spoke because she said yes. And it was so important that yes, because many things that we did later depended uh, on this uh, uh, result that we found. What did we find? We found that uh, the major resistance genes were in that location, we identified them, but contrary to what was known, they were duplicated, meaning that it was much complex to analyze than uh, what we initially thought. And that, pa that work led to a major paper that also was important for me applying for future funding. So two major moves supported by my supervisor, which actually play major role in my career. Thank you, Janet, for that uh, open-mindedness. Open during the, 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 the three, uh, four years, we published a lot of papers that actually strengthened the, 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 the profile, making us competitive now to think what next after the postdoc, because it was a four-year postdoc. In the middle of the third year, the question was what to do next. And then I identified this option of doing, uh, applying for a welcome cross car research career development. And I spoke with uh, Janet and Hilary. Hilary was back already at the school, and we agreed that I was ready for it. I applied, and I went through, a, I was solicited first of all for interview, and later on, uh, I went for the interview after a series of challenging mock, mock interviews done in the department. It was really tough. Actually, when I went for the interview, it was easy at the interview, because at, uh, in the school, I have given a tough, tough time but something very encouraging for me was the day before I departed to London, 
Janet and Hillary invited me in the office and they asked me quick questions. And in the middle of the second question, they said, no, 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 stop, you are ready, you can go. And the way it, it, it happened there in London is the question that they asked me was actually those asked, they, I, I was asked uh, during the mock interview. So I was really ready and I apparently gave a good performance. As you can see, that was December 2007 and I got this email on the 17th of December. I am pleased to tell you that the outcome of your interview at the cross on the 5th was successful and so on and so on. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. You can imagine that I had a really a Merry Christmas because that was a fantastic news, opening a new chapter in, the, in my career. And talking about that uh, new chapter, a key development was me recruiting my first postdoc. And because the Welcome Cross didn't have the funding to allow that, only a technician could be uh, funded. But I needed a postdoc to move, to do more things, to put in place the ideas that I had. And by providence or by chance, I came in contact with uh, Jacob Riveron uh, because he sent me an email, an innocent email that I could have disregarded. But I replied, he was looking for, our, I mean, for uh, more information on the uh, uh, genome of Anopheles Venusius. It was not sequenced yet, so it was tricky to work with, and I was well placed in that. And I replied, and later on, he actually asked me whether he could come and work with me because he has a, f uh, a, a fellowship uh, taking in charge his salary. So I didn't need, need to do anything. Of course, I say yes. And then he joined the team, and with Jacob, we did a lot of functional genomics, and um, which actually significantly improved the uh, research output, uh, the impact factor we can, of the journal we can publish in. As you can see here, one uh, PNS paper, and then another one in genome biology, which was really important. And Jacob also, beyond that, contributed a lot in capacity building, because when we, I moved to Cameroon, Jacob did the same, and he spent three years with us before, unfortunately, or fortunately also, because that's part of the journey, before moving to uh, elsewhere, where he is now working at Syngenta as a team leader there. And, um, but you also learn that you need to let go for the better good. And just this slide is just to really uh, uh, speak a bit about how I started uh, in supervising the students, and particularly master's students. And I, I, I really appreciated that I was early enough uh, involved maybe not as a primary uh, supervisor, but a secondary supervisor with Hilary, uh, co-supervising this student in 2005, and I was uh, the bench supervisor showing what to do. And it was really important because I learned how to, to do that while being mentored by someone more experienced. And I think it's something that younger scientists need to learn to do as well. And that contact, because he was from Uganda, later on, because we were developing things in Uganda, the Deus, actually uh, lead, uh, led us to another student candidate in Uganda with whom we applied for a Welcome Cross Fellowship. Uh, I also wanted to highlight from these slides that we um, also uh, encourage during our uh, super supervision uh, that the students not, should not just do the master for the sake of doing it, but do, to do quality research projects. And I just showed this to uh, uh, highlight the fact that most of these work have been published and the students have been published as first author. Like Naomi Plack, she got the best um, uh, master dissertation in 2010, and this, her work was published. Similar for Rachel Kiaskowska, her work too was published as first author. And now, I think I was ready to also be involved in supervising PhD students. And the first one came also by random chance, because someone intern from Malaysia contacted me about the possibility of doing a, mass, a PhD with me. And although the topic was different from my primary interest, I was open-minded to accept and to supervise her working on resistance in uh, AIDS uh, uh, vector uh, of dengue. And uh, really, it shows you that just by responding kindly to an email, it might open op new opportunities. So I will encourage everyone receiving emails from this uh, potential candidate not to ignore, you never know. And uh, we uh, really published well with Intan, and it was really a good experience. And again, when I started this, I was uh, uh, supported by Hilary, who was also acting as a second, second supervisor. And 
The next one was also from one who contacted me by email. It's the room Suleiman Ibrahim, who actually came to the school to do a work with, um, uh, on allelic variation and the, uh, the, the role of allelic variation on resistance gene, on resistance mechanism. And we did a lot of work publishing high impact factor uh, journal and again collaborating with colleagues in the department. And uh, Suleiman has gone on to also ab obtain his own fellowship and uh, also contributing to the supervision of other uh, scientists, notably Abdullahi Muhammad, who is in the room, who recently graduated his PhD actually a few, few days ago. So just to show that it's a chain that needs to be uh, maintained. I also learned during my, my career so far that it's so important that leading a PhD to be productive is actually a win-win situation for everyone. And uh, I'm just highlighting a few of them here. Kayla Barnes, who did a PhD with me, and Janet, 2015, uh, Miranda Dula, also publishing really in high impact factor as first author, and all together contributing to the success of the team. So all these things led, as Hilary mentioned earlier, to me being successful in applying for the senior fellowship. That was um, uh, five years after the career development. And it was very challenging because uh, it's about success rate is very low. But I was uh, uh, pleased to receive another email confirming that I was successful. And you can see this time the budget was much bigger. And in that plan, I had already included the option of returning to Cameroon two years after that uh, uh, senior fellowship because of my desire in contributing to capacity bridging uh, much more directly, if I can say so. So this is the return, therefore, in Cameroon. I returned to the institution where I did my PhD uh, uh, in, uh, in Cameroon. Why? Because for scientific reasons, in part of my, my uh, fellowship needed to use field, uh, station, field uh, experimental hot trial in the, in the field in, the, in Cameroon. But also I wanted to contribute to capacity bridging for the next generation of African scientists. And this is because I was mindful of the fact that um, black scientists are really lagging behind. I will, I don't know if they're lagging behind, but the situation is that they are not uh, playing a major role in when you compare the funding. Let's take this uh, um, graph, uh, which is from the Welcome Cross 2019 20, uh, 2020 report, showing that from UK based scientists, our this only, z I mean, 0% were black Afri uh, African scientists. And this is something really that bothers me a lot. I mean, it's not really 0%. It's 0, 0.00 something. Because that year, I got my, the renewal of my senior fellowship. So I know that it's not 0, 0. But it's, it's pretty zero. And how can we change the dynamic? There are many things that could be done. But one of these also is to uh, train the next generation of African scientists to be even more competitive because after all, it's a competitive field. So that was one of the reasons why I went back to, 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 to Cameroon. But going back, I maintain a model that will allow me to still be uh, uh, involved in the work from the Liverpool School of, uh, of, of Tropical Medicine because part of my team remained there and led by uh, several postdocs and Helen as a technician, but also developing a team in Cameroon that could be competitive uh, enough. And talking about competitiveness, the two, part, the two teams, uh, Cameroon and Liverpool, really are working together. You can see this paper that we published in 2019, where we detected the first DNA-based molecular markers for metabolic resistance, was actually done conjointly by uh, Gareth Ridal, a postdoc here in Liverpool, and Leon Mugesi, a PhD student in, in, in Cameroon. And going to Cameroon also could have been seen as a risk whether we will maintain the same level of science that we used to do in Liverpool. Uh, the work generated by local scientists really is showing that the quality is still maintained, if not even greater. Because you can see a PhD student publishing enough science, translational medicine, nature communication, molecular ecology, and Leon really is an example of what could be possible when uh, those uh, scientists locally are given the space and the environment to develop. He, he, he graduated last year. Another one is Marginal Chouakui, who is doing tremendous amount of work and publishing well, and is currently applying for his own uh, fellowship as the early career award for Welcome Cross. 
it's just to show again what is feasible when, peop when you are on the ground. So altogether, all the work that we have done has led us to sponsor many fellows across Africa, starting with master fellowship. And this using the welcome cost of, uh, scheme for tropical health and, 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 and public, no, for tropical medicine and public health. Unfortunately, the scheme has stopped, but it was a very useful scheme uh, helping to train the next generation of African scientists and even in Southern America, as it was the case with Carlos. And we have also done the same for the training fellowship, where we have, uh, we have sponsored several fellows from different uh, regions of Africa. And uh, this was a scheme for three years with 260 to 300K funding for themselves to establish their own research and supported uh, uh, throughout. And the, most of them were also able to visit Liverpool, where they were interacting further with us. And be, be, beside that, we also worked with uh, spons for, uh, in sponsoring intermediate fellows uh, in, in different uh, regions of the continent. And um, these were from Cameroon, Benin, uh, Kenya recently. And uh, the, the goal here is really for these intermediate scientists to establish and strengthen their own group and be ready to take uh, to the lead on, on in the field. And uh, one of the rare uh, uh, case of senior fellowship in public health in, Af in, in Africa was the one that we sponsored, Dr. Antonio. Initially, we, we as, as sponsored him for the intermediate with uh, Hilary, but later on for the senior fellowship, I was the sponsor for the work done on La Visage in, in Cameroon. So all this work, all this uh, support, all this achievement scientifically, as well as uh, strengthening the research group, the uh, quality of the publication, the, 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 the grant uh, uh, income, and, uh, uh, and the international standing with my role at the WHO and other consortium actually was really important for me being promoted as a professor in the school uh, and also having my senior fellowship renewed in 2019, as you can see. Um, besides the individual capacity building, I have also moved into doing so within consortium. Hilary already mentioned the PVEC, but there are also uh, others like the Delta Matad, uh, a five million pound uh, uh, grant funded by the Welcome Cross. And we also have another one with the uh, uh, PAMCA, the Pan-African Mosquito uh, uh, Control Association, working to uh, use molecular surveillance uh, in, in, in across Africa. I will maybe spend a, a few slides on PVEC because it was an exceptional scheme uh, really to uh, drive uh, capacity building across Africa. And it was a team uh, of uh, people from different backgrounds uh, in terms of expertise working together to achieve that goal. And we train a lot of scientists across the continent. Uh, I, I just highlight here in blue those that I directly supervise because based in Cameroon. And uh, these were very talented young scientists willing to, 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 to really learn and we mentor them. And I will just take one example is the case of Uget, Uget Simo, who not only uh, uh, did uh, uh, excellently during the three years of the fellowship, but uh, uh, among them, she detected for the first time the circulation of uh, three serotypes of dengue in Central Africa, which was new. But she also was involved in supervising her own PhD student, who also did a lot of uh, work and uh, has been publishing. Uh, Francine now has three first author papers uh, in her name, just to show you the quality of work that could be done. And beside individual, we also went to, uh, 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 to be involved in capacity building at the institutional level. Hilary mentioned that we helped set up the Technical Vector Control Advisory Group, TVCAC, which was really a platform bringing together all the various stakeholders in vector control in Cameroon, as it was done also in uh, Malawi and in uh, Burkina Faso. You can see the first uh, meeting, uh, Hilary visited Cameroon at that, that, that time, where it was also uh, uh, highlighted in the national media for really uh, uh, make, uh, highlight the need for vector control more broadly. And just to show that this was also a case where scientists and together with national Maya con with control program worked together. As you can see, we funded a lot of uh, maybe 13 op uh, operational research projects uh, and the choice of the topic was done together with the control program managers 
either for malaria, for uh, sleeping sickness, for onchocerciasis. They told us what was important in relation to what was known. And these were awarded but to early career local scientists, really helping to boost their profile. And uh, Cameroon also had the opportunity to host, I think, the unique annual meeting because COVID came to change everything. That was 2019, and it was done in the presence of the UK High Commissioner in Cameroon. And uh, again, a reminder that when we work together, we can achieve a lot more. And another area of uh, capacity building, this time at, uh, at the level of institutional uh, 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 level, sorry, is the creation of, uh, of the Center for Research in Infectious Diseases, three. Because uh, uh, Africa is suffering a lot because of the lack of efficient research institutions where research could be uh, performed at the high level uh, across the continent. Uh, two years after returning to Cameroon, due to administrative, administrative challenges, I, 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 I worked with uh, a group of local scientists to uh, create CREED, and uh, it's a non-profit research institution uh, and funded in 2018, focusing on infectious diseases, notably vector-borne ones, and the vision really is to uh, help save life through quality research done in Africa. And for that, CREED has placed itself as a major player with uh, partnership with several stakeholders. First of all, at the national level, CREED is collaborating with the Ministry of Health. We have an official uh, uh, um, uh, agreement between the, the, the two, and uh, CREED is interacting strongly with the National Malaria Control Program, helping them to design the resistance management strategies. and. Um, I already mentioned the setup of the Technical Vector Control Advisory Group and uh, again working with different disease control programs. Uh, also, at the national level, CREED has established itself as the reference lab for the molecular surveillance activities done by the PMI, which is the President Malaria Initiative in Cameroon, in Sierra Leone, and, 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 and in Chad. And CREED also has developed capacity at different levels, hosting several African scientists uh, uh, who are fellow of, uh, from Welcome Cross uh, or even Royal Society, FLAIR, uh, NIH, and currently CREED has 30 PhD students coming from different universities in Cameroon, but also in Central Africa from Rwanda and, so, and, and Congo Democratic. At the regional level, CREED has established itself also as a major player, uh, 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 working particularly with the Pan-African Mosquito Association Control uh, uh, Association, uh, PAMCA, and CREED is the reference center training the uh, African scientists in vector biology across the continent. At international level, we have strong collaboration with uh, various uh, uh, institutions, including IVCC, we have PVEC, PAMCA, and various universities uh, across, across the world. And locally, too, interacting with other, other, other uh, uh, um, stakeholders. I, I put this slide just to highlight the close work that we are doing with the National Malaria Control Program. In this case, in the middle, you have the uh, coordinator of the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Achu, who actually worked with us to train the uh, medical entomologists at the health district sector because the next step for control program is to be done not just at the central level, but at the district level. And also, in terms of promotion of scientific output, CREED is also working with the National Malaria Control Program to, to organize symposium uh, across uh, uh, in, in, in Cameroon. And CREED, not beyond that uh, interaction with stakeholder, has also established itself as a reference center in genomics in Central Africa, having the uh, equipment for uh, next genome sequencing from uh, the mini ion nanopore technology, um, uh, MySIC, uh, and, and also having a server uh, which is now uh, 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 available through funding uh, uh, from the PAMCA funded uh, project. And really, CREED also is working with Africa CDC to uh, uh, have it in place a network of research center for uh, the surveillance of pathogen across the continent. We want to learn from COVID and other Ebola to be in advance in this uh, 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 um, process. And for example, uh, CREED now is able to sequence the whole genome of of COVID as it was done through a training organized by colleagues with, with, with colleagues in Nigeria in, in February 2002, where we actually uh, sequenced the whole genome of COVID uh, uh, locally 
uh, showing that since uh, from December, uh, Omicron was already the predominant uh, variant in Cameroon as well. So just to uh, highlight the uh, quality of expertise at CRE, with a team of uh, experts uh, from scientists, postdoc, uh, PhD students, uh, 15, uh, not, not five, uh, technicians, and a lot of master students supported by admin and, and support staff, allowing us to do a lot of work in connection with various partners. Among this, this is just to show you, recently that was in May, uh, where uh, Chris hosted uh, an annual meeting of a project funded by the, Gate and, uh, uh, Melinda, the Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation on uh, next generation of uh, 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 surveillance tools. And this was a team for the John Hopkins visiting Cray to, to work uh, with, with the local team. And because we believe that it's important that uh, the uh, fe uh, female scientists are also developed. Cray really is putting a lot of emphasis in this area. 30% uh, uh, of our PhD uh, scientists are currently females. 50% of the PhD students are, fe are, are female, and in the administration, uh, in the, among the lab technicians, this also is reflected. We believe that it's important to invest in them to sustain uh, any uh, development uh, done. And the good news also for us at CRE is that in four years, we have uh, built a new facility that will give us uh, uh, enough space to uh, do more. Uh, and having a, a well-equipped lab, uh, s space for insectary, and a, a, a more equipment. As you can see in this slide, we have uh, a, a, a well-equipped laboratory and insectary. I just put some pictures for SPSC that is being used to assess the quality of bed nets currently being distributed in Cameroon. And we have uh, for the uh, molecular biology facilities, and then we have our next generation facilities also in place now. So you can have a lot of ideas, but it's also good to maintain a good working environment. This is what we do at CREI, and uh, this is just to show you uh, that at the occasion of the celebration of the Labor Day, the staff came together to celebrate the day. And during that time, also, the best uh, staff were also uh, celebrated, just to encourage the team spirit among the, 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 the workers. And with this setting in place now, CREI is moving to new uh, 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 areas, notably in uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, CRED was recently awarded a $3 million, pound, uh, $3 million do uh, grant from the Gate Foundation uh, to implement what we call the African Consortium for Modeling of Vector Control. This we train 15 PhD students across the continent working in collaboration with seven African uh, uh, institutions and CREI Northern Institution as well. So, as I close, uh, I wanted to add this slide just to show that you can be involved in capacity building while still maintaining uh, 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 excellent science, uh, uh, as reflected from the fact that uh, uh, my personal out research output has improved. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, and recently, uh, my citations are going up, as you can see and also my publication in terms of number and quality also is improving. And beside that, even the funding is also increasing with around 15 million uh, US dollars uh, obtained in the past four years, just to show that we can invest in others while remaining competitive in the things, in, in the science that we are performing. So to close, I would like to take time to thank really some people or institutions that have really supported my work so far. On top of them, I will put Janet uh, and, and Hilary present here. Uh, really, thank you again for taking the risk for, uh, in, to invest in an unknown person at, uh, that I was at that, at that time. I hope that what I've achieved so far um, is uh, pleasing to you, if you can say so. I would like to thank also colleagues in the Vector Biology Department because really the interaction de uh, within the department is really great. And uh, Martin, as the head of the department here, is uh, really uh, uh, supporting this, and uh, I, we appreciate that again. My various students, I would like to thank them for giving me the opportunity to supervise them and to mentor them daily. My past and uh, current postdocs, Jacob, Gareth, Jack, Suleiman, uh, Talal, uh, and so on in, in, the, in, the, in the room, uh, and those in Cameroon. And uh, Helen Irving, really, has been a close collaborator for the past 17 years 
and I really want to appreciate the tremendous work she has done to develop our group. And uh, you can have the best ideas, but if you have no money, there's nothing you can do. So that's why I would like to thank the funders, particularly the Welcome Trust, but uh, increasingly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I would like to thank the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine as a whole for providing me this platform for success and uh, investment in others. And the team in, in, at Trade in Cameroon is doing tremendous work and supporting this vision. I would like to thank them and like to thank also the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene for recognizing my work and awarding me this Chalmers Medal. Thank you very much for listening. Charles, that was amazing and so great to hear about the successes that you've had and, and how you've empowered and inspired others to, um, to start their journeys of research and their own successes. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, we need to use the mic for questions so that it picks up on the audio. Does anyone have anything they would like to ask Charles? Well, John, uh, Charles, great <coughs> career trajectory. As your institution grows, how are you going to maintain your own research program, or do you see yourself moving more and more over into a, a manager of research rather than the primary doer? That question is quite interesting. Um, um, I remain passionate in doing my research, maintaining my focus on developing my research. That's why even at trade between Liverpool, I always maintain a close link with my research team. Um, but developing others, letting others develop their own research, their own, uh, uh, implementing their own vision within the environment that we created, like trade. So, it's a challenge, I know, because it's more and more demanding in terms of time. I need to be better organized to uh, attend those administrative duties while still performing my research, writing grants, analyzing data. Uh, it's a challenge, Janet. I know that you asked that question because you have <laughs> experienced that also, but it's um, a, a challenge. My goal would be to maintain a focus on research as much as I can. It might be a time that is not feasible, but as much as possible, I would like to maintain a focus also in research. Thank you. Any other questions for Charles? Thanks very much for the presentation, Charles. Um, really impressive career and really looking forward to see what you do next. Um, you. I just wanted to ask, um, in your opinion, what has been um, the most important factor that has contributed to this amount of success? And at the same time, what would you recognize as the greatest challenge preventing you from achieving more? Thank you. What has contributed the most, I think would be opportunity given to me. And uh, I started my talk by focusing on what happened during my PhD and later on during my postdoc. And I think if I was not given the opportunity to develop myself, first of all, scientifically, and then given opportunity to do things, I wouldn't have been here. And I'm always grateful that my PhD supervisor look at me, not just someone who deliver on a single project and then that would be the end, but invested in me attending uh, courses, attending uh, uh, conferences, meeting people, broadening my scope. And later on when I moved to the school, uh, working with Janet and Hilary, doing more of this, and I think it was tremendous. So the foundation was strong, I would say. So that's why as PhD supervisors uh, or, or, or mentors of uh, junior scientists, we need to give them that strong foundation. Because without it, you, can, you, may, be, uh, uh, you may have all the willingness of the world, but you won't, you won't do much. So I was blessed with a strong foundation for my PhD and my postdoc allowing me to achieve more. Later on, there are other factors, but for me, this would be the major one at the beginning uh, to, to, to stand on solid ground. Later on, what was, well, or what would be the things that may have limited me doing more? Uh, it's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I always felt like, uh, particularly in the beginning, if I had a better English, I could have done more early days because, you know, when I started uh, writing a, a manuscript from a French-speaking person, it's not, it, was, it was not easy. 
and I had to learn the hard way. Because in school, we actually disregarded English at that time. Uh, without me knowing that later on, it would be a major tool for me uh, uh, do, doing what I, I like to do the most. So it could have been that. Um, although, honestly, I, I don't have something that jumped uh, in my head as uh, a major barrier. Some people will say, okay, uh, could be a, a, a black African be also a factor? It could be, but to be honest with you, I have not you know, come across it, or I didn't put it uh, in my mind as a, major, a, a potential barrier. I just want to give my best and let people appreciate what is being done. And I think uh, that is something that I have to say. And I will encourage other African scientists to do that, although it doesn't mean that there are no barriers that people uh, from uh, uh, black uh, communities are facing. As I show you the graph, 0%, 0% funding. It's not right. Something is wrong somewhere and needs to be addressed. But at the same time, I think uh, when opportunity is given to someone, take advantage and go, go for it. Maybe not. Oh, yes, Charles. Charles, fabulous talk. And um, so many things uh, resonated and shone through for me. Could I pick on the amazing thing you've done there with establishing an, a whole vibrant org research organization overseas? Mm -hmm. and ask you to give us some thoughts on how that research organization, how you see that research organization interfacing with organizations in Cameroon and regionally, and also with us at LSTM longer term. Yes, I think I'm uh, always uh, quick to advocate um, partnership collaboration. And I think uh, alone, you cannot do much. So. I really see the place of Crete playing a major role uh, in infectious disease uh, research by collaborating with others. Regionally, which is the original case, we are collaborating strongly with several institutions in Cameroon, in Central Africa, and uh, we, will, we are doing the same with other across the continent and outside. Uh, and LSTM is playing a major role with that because I have to say that if LSTM has not allowed me to go to Cameroon, trade would not happen. I think trade, uh, uh, LSTM deserves a lot of credit for allowing that. But also, LSTM partnership with trade can be done through um, special or uh, close uh, uh, agreement, either uh, subcontract. As it, it's already happening, actually, because uh, trade initially was receiving funding from LSTM. It was one-way traffic. But now, LSTM is receiving money from Creed. We There are some uh, uh, funding schemes which are directed only to uh, low and middle income countries. And Creed is well placed to uh, 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 be awarded, to, uh, to, be, to compete for that. And once it's done, it could partner with uh, Northern institutions. And for that, LSTM is playing a major role. I, I can see that happening more and more. And another uh, example is PVEC. PVEC was a consortium uh, led from LSTM, but with Crete playing a major role in implementing it on the ground in Africa. So there are various ways where interactions could happen, but there is, pass is uh, I'm confident there's a lot of room to work together to achieve more. There's definitely room for that. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I guess my question is about, um, well, looking at your career and for, for someone who's maybe a recent PhD kind of graduate, um, reflecting on your career yourself or advice that you'd give to your, your postdocs, to, I guess to which extent would you kind of say that 
uh, you are very kind of opportunistic or strategic in kind of pursuing these opportunities or how would you kind of balance that or you know what, what kind of advice would you give about that? <laughs> good, good, good question. <laughs> I think you have to be pretty much um, both uh, because there are opportunities that come your way. You need to be able to seize on the opportunity. That was the case for the postdoc who came to me saying, hang on, I like what you are doing. I would like to work with you. And by the way, I have my salary for two years. I cannot say no. And when that comes, I, I, I really uh, was happy to take uh, uh, to seize the opportunity and to move with that. But at the same time, you also cannot achieve much with that strategy. You cannot achieve much with that strategy. One example is, when I came to the school in 2004, during that year, I already thought about what will happen after my four years postdoc will end. It was a time limited, four years. No commitment for after that. So I knew that to apply to, uh, to a fellowship, which I, uh, I came across, there were some requirements. And some of that w were publication. And to publish, I needed to generate data, generate results. I was working hard for that. Actually, that was the reason why I went to see Janet in, in the middle of that in 2006. Please, I can do more if you give me manpower. And she did. So it was not, she said yes, but that because in my strategy, it was important, and I, I, I went, she was the director of the school. So it was not just someone you just come and knock the door, uh, all this was open. But I needed to ask for the appointment for that to happen. And she said yes. So that was part of the strategy, although the opportunity was given to me. So you have to do it both ways. Same thing for uh, being successful for a senior welcome course fellowship. When I was a career development fellow, I was attending every two years um, a meeting of the Welcome Course Fellows. And they will tell you what to do if you want to go to the next stage. Sometimes they will bring someone who was, who was already a senior fellow, and the person will give a testimony, and this, the, the tips of the things you need to do now to be successful for the, for, for the next stage. And one of them was make sure you publish as a senior author and things like that. So I arranged everything to ensure that by the end of the five year of, of, of uh, career development, I was ready to apply. So you have to mix both, and ready to seize opportunities that comes your way, but also be strategic, because you cannot be successful if you don't think about it. You need to put a plan in place and do your best to uh, implement it. This is a quick one. Charles, really, you are a success story. It's very inspiring to listen. Thank you very much for your presentation. Something just jumped out at me is the reference to supervisors, supervisors. There are just people that when they are mentoring you and supervising, you can be sure you're gonna be moving. And that's really, really good. That it doesn't happen to everyone, unfortunately. Well, I'm very happy that when you went to establish Creed, one, one of the things you've been doing is training this large group of PhDs and all that. And my question was a little bit related to Bertie's. Yeah. And I wanted to know how um, your PhD graduates, so all the people you train at that level, where are they now? Are they in Creed? Or are you hoping to spread these people out? Because the whole paradigm of having supportive supervisors, supervisors that can identify with the needs, you know, and the needs to have these sort of people in areas that are not well served, for instance, Africa, is really, really important. So if you have people growing with that paradigm, it's, it's important they are scattered in the country rather than yeah. concentrated in Creed. <laughs> Just wanted to know about what's happening. Uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, question, and uh, you are right. Our main focus was to train uh, those PhD students, and actually most of them are graduating uh, this year, and uh, because we started 2018, and we are already uh, where we are getting a significant number of graduating. Uh, the demand is really there, because if I just send you a few emails I got in the past a week, in the past week, yes, one a colleague in uh, Benin uh, asked him whether I can send him a potential postdoc in the things we do. Another one in um, uh, Burkina Faso asking whether not only we can host, but we can also send uh, 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 in this field. And we are actually uh, working with PAMCA uh, to uh, train what we call uh, molecular entomologists. 
on the, there's a workshop that will happen in August. Uh, and one of the PhD students who was working at, uh, who graduated from K is actually now in Nigeria, working, uh, excuse me, I forgot the name of the university, I think it's, uh, sorry, Covenant, Covenant. Thank you, Suleiman, for coming to my rescue. <laughs> Covenant University. She came to me, and I already had a project that she could work on. And she told me she would like to uh, go because she saw so. I say I would like to you to stay, but actually, as my supervisor, my PhD told me, uh, the choice is yours. And she chose to go, and I wrote a request letter for that. So I really think this is the way to go. We claim, but we share as well. And trade we share, but we, we, we also have areas where we are not strong, and we hope to receive uh, also the same support. So I think this is the way it's, it will be working together to improve the, 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 the quality of the work done uh, across Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, I might ask one last question. Um, and part of this is speaking to all of the people that really wanted to come today but weren't able to, uh, one reason or another. And part of it is about the, the society. Just to take you back to the time before your very first grant, um, obviously part of what we do at RSTMH is to try and give out as many early career grants as possible. And last year or the year before, uh, more are given out to researchers across Africa than any other uh, area, region, continent. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to ask some advice because many people are in touch with us and they don't have the confidence to just put pen to paper for that first or fingers to keyboard for that first grant application, their first budget, the first project statement, the first research question even. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be uh, to them if we can share this with them? And also for the society, what more can we do to try and ensure that people don't um, – uh, give up or don't attempt that, that first step which is so important in a journey like research? The advice I would give to um, early career uh, uh, scientists we, is if you are applying, you have an idea, don't keep it for yourself. Go and see a mentor who can be your PhD supervisor or master sup uh, supervisor, but it might not be. You, you just have to scan across and even send email. Because these days, you don't have to only meet people face to face. Even emails, I told you already in my case, how I actually uh, work with people just starting with a simple email. So that also is possible. So I would encourage those young scientists not to keep the ideas to themselves, to go and share it with other people. Because when you have a feedback, it can only help you to improve what you have. And, and I personally also experienced that when you write a first draft of a proposal, you share, you share it with others, the comments that come from them can actually help you to refine and to improve the quality because it's very competitive. I think people always need to be reminded that it's not given just for the sake of you know, sharing money. It's about selecting the best. So increase your competitiveness by having support from mentors. That is really what I could do, but also identify a good research question which come from reading. We also have to encourage young scientists to read and uh, to go across uh, uh, the uh, 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 scientific uh, 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 review, uh, literature to find out what is happening, what, where are the major gaps that need to be uh, uh, answered. I think if they have that, they could be uh, ready to ask the right question which could be funded after they have been supported by supervisors. Now, for the society, why can the society do more to uh, encourage uh, 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 early career uh, scientists to be involved? I think uh, it's already a tremendous uh, uh, achievement in sustaining this scheme, which gives out 5,000 pounds to young scientists for a one-year project. And I came, um, I came across many people now willing to apply. So it's really having, uh, this scheme is having the visibility and it's a stepping stone for those young scientists to think that, hey, I could do it myself. I could start some, somewhere. And I think it's, uh, I would encourage the, 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 the society to continue with that. Now, how best can this have an impact? Maybe it would be to look at whether uh, there could be a thematic uh, 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 orientation, because at the moment, I think it's open. And uh, maybe strategically, 
the society may decide to refine or select some of the major uh, uh, topics, although the risk also, also could be that it, uh, it can exclude some potentially good ones, but see the balance. And uh, seco sec second sec secondly, the society also could try to, uh, I, I was thinking about the um, next step, because some of them could have achieved a lot with the 5K, but may not have immediate funding to uh, uh, do more and to uh, refine their profile to that big grant. I, I got a 10K uh, uh, when I did my PhD, and later on I, I was awarded also a 25,000 uh, 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 US dollars to do uh, 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 to, uh, to improve of what I did during my PhD. That could be also an option. I don't know the funding situation, but if it was possible, I think a second phase after the 5K could be helpful. It could be 10K only for those that show successful implementation of the 5K. I, that, that could be uh, a way to, to go forward. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Charles. So just to finish um, the, uh, the talk, thank you so much, Charles. Um, it's really inspiring. And I know that many people who are not here will also be able to be inspired by your words and your journey. Um, thank you, Hilary, for nominating him, um, and to Janet for, for your support, and all of you for sparing the time to be here. I know it's such a lovely day outside, which is rare for us. Um, so being here with us makes a real, um, you know, makes a real difference to us, and thank you. Um, just a couple of things about RSTMH before I go. If you haven't signed up to the newsletter, please do. It's the best way to find out about everything we're doing. Um, and we really are striving to do as much as we can to encourage new researchers, new innovators, the, the future leaders of the sector. Um, please join us for the reception um, just over the way with some, some drinks and snacks. And we're back in Liverpool in October, actually, for our annual meeting on the 11th and 12th. The, topic, uh, the theme of the, uh, of the meeting is topics in malaria and resistance, and it's a two-day meeting, lots of really great content. Abstract calls are open, and as are travel scholarships. So again, in your networks, and for those that are listening to this after today, please do think about um, those deadline the 24th, so you have a week um, to get busy on those. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you. Please join us at the reception.